Amen. Good to be here this morning. Are you glad to be in God's house? Say amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter number 29, Proverbs chapter 29. And this morning I want to um, preach on this thought of America's three fault lines, America's three fault lines. On New Year's Day this past Monday, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake struck right off of Japan. The entire fishing village of Wajima was reduced to a pile of rubble, and soon after, a fire consumed just about everything that was left in that town. Over 126 bodies have been found, people that lost their lives, and there's still 200 that are unaccounted for. In geology, a fault is a planar fracture or a discontinuity in a volume of rock across which there has been a significant displacement as a result of a rock mass movement. It literally is earth, as you know from school, sections of earth that are moving at different rates of speed or in different directions. Due to friction of these rocks and moving at different speeds, they can fracture or rupture and create what is known as an earthquake. We find that fault lines thus are a result of friction of two objects of mass moving. It really, as I said, can move in three ways. They are divergent movements, which are moving apart, convergent, which are pieces of earth moving together, or transform, which are those plates that are moving side by side. Divergent faults create oceans and separate continents, while convergent and transform faults result in earthquakes. There are five major fault lines that are here in America. The first is the Cascadia subduction zone. It has been over 100 years since this last ruptured. It was when Lewis and Clark arrived on the West Coast in 1805. The second major fault is the New Madrid seismic zone. This spans from Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, or Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. It is also the most active zone east of the Rocky Mountains. It once ruptured so aggressively that the Mississippi River flowed backwards for several hours. The third major zone here in the U.S. is the Rampo Seismic Zone. It runs through Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. In 1884, it shook so violently that it could be felt in Maine and Virginia. A portion of this fault runs through the middle of New York City, and even a 5.0 magnitude earthquake that lasted for a couple of minutes could be devastating to New York City. There is the Hayward Fault, Perhaps the most famous fault, it runs through California and has been the source of many volatile earthquakes. The fifth is the Denali Fault Zone that is there in Alaska. This is home to the largest inland earthquake in sheer magnitude in the U.S. for the last 150 years. It happened on November 3rd, 2002. It ran for 200 miles and lasted for two to three minutes. It was so severe that it caused waves and pools as far away as Texas and Louisiana. That's some distance from Alaska. An earthquake in Shenzhen, China, January 23rd of 1556, was the most deadly earthquake in recorded history that we know of, and it's estimated that 830,000 people lost their lives in that earthquake. Earthquake quakes can be devastating. They can ruin infrastructure, water supplies, take lives, and cause ripple effects far beyond their origin. Just as we see in this past week from the earthquake that took place in Japan, there were tsunami warnings that go far beyond the borders of the earthquake. All of this is a result of friction. I want to make clear that this friction is not accidental, that we're talking about America's fault lines. It's not accidental, but rather intentional. 
there is an active measure underway to radically reshape our nation and the church. There is friction that is being created with the intent of causing a seismic disturbance that will reshape our culture. The Bible warns us against evil nations and evil leaders. If you have your Bibles in Proverbs chapter 29, I want to read several verses. Verse number 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Verse number 4, the king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overthrows it. Drop down to verse number 12. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. Verse number 14, the king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. Verse number 16 says, when the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. Verse number 18, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. We find here in Proverbs 29 the, the outlook of a nation of a people who reject God and who elect unrighteous rulers and leaders. But in contrast, we see in Psalms 33 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. This morning, America has some massive things happening below surface that are with the intent of causing disruption and changing the landscape of our nation. I believe that this is evident as we look forward to 2024 being the, uh, this being the first Sunday of the year. I believe that if you look at it, we better buckle up our seatbelts. This may be a volatile year in American history. There's a undertow of things that are transpiring. And the first one I want to look at, our first fault line that is going to cause major disruption is the ego, what I'm going to call the egocentric focus. It is that we are focusing upon ourselves and we are bought in many times to the lie that Satan is trying to give to us that it's okay, just do as you want, do as you please, it'll be all right. Focus on me, my, I, an egocentric focus. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 5. The Bible says, everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. The Bible clearly tells us that those who are proud in their own heart, that it's an abomination to the Lord. And Satan will try to confuse us, try to manipulate us, and try to get us focused in upon ourselves. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 2 says, When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble, it's wisdom. All about pride All about me. And I want you to say that if you look at our culture, look at our society, look around the world, there is a massive focus upon telling everyone, just do what makes you feel good. I can tell you this morning that that mindset, that thought process is contrary to God's word and it is of the devil. We are not to do what is right to ourselves, but rather there is an authority above us that is unmovable, unshakable. It is the truth and morality of a holy, righteous God, and it is not to be moved. But Satan is trying to move the boundaries. He's trying to shake and trying to cause destruction that the boundaries may be moved, that we may say, listen, morality is merely based upon what I think and what I feel, what I desire, and not upon God. Yet there must be truth. Two opposing thoughts cannot both be true, and yet this world opposes God and claims to be true, and we must purpose in our heart and we must come to the realization that we will hold fast to the things of God and what God claims to be true 
we're just going to hold that it's true. And what God says is false and sin, that we will be steadfast, unmovable in our character, in our hearts, in our nature, in our souls, and saying, listen, if God says that it's wrong, if God says that it's sin, I'm just going to stand against it, whether it's popular or unpopular. Why? Because Satan is seeking to cause us to focus upon ourselves to do what's right in our own eyes. We have made ourselves to be God here in America, and as such, we have rejected his truth and made our own truth. We have rejected the truths that our nation was built on and instead have actively demolished our foundation and replaced it with an ever-changing ideology that is moving constantly and the, the bar seems like it's always being moved. We think, well, we were told the lie, which we knew better if you had any sense about you. If you will just accept this in our culture, then that'll be, that's all we want. And our society caved in with many things, with same-sex marriage, and you say, that's all we want. Our nation caved in, and then the boundary was moved. And so we gave a little more, and what happened? The boundary was moved. The boundaries are always moving. It seems like we're, we're aiming at a, never, a, a target you can never hit. Why? Because Satan is trying to can, uh, can, uh, deceive us into being our own gods so that we can do what's right in our own eyes. As a nation, we once fought against socialism, but now we're steaming ahead towards it. Every decision as a nation that we have made for the two plus decades have been egocentric, all about the individual and self. We find this is evident in our culture with abortion. We look at the devastating effects throughout history when we would say, listen, we would never be like the pagans who uh, offer their babies up to Moloch and the gods and threw their children into the fire and sacrificed them. Yet as a nation, we've said we'll sacrifice our children for our gods of ourselves as long as it meets our need. I talked to someone recently who had went and visited an abortion clinic, uh, someone who was uh, with, with child and and went and they said it was the most beautiful, serene place they'd ever been. The music, the environment, they said it was just wonderful. Why? Because Satan paints that picture, does he not? And the world says, listen, if it's an inconvenience to you, it's all about egocentric. It's about yourself. And if it would make your life better, sacrifice your child upon the altar to your God who is yourself. About ourselves. The only problem is we are not God. He is already God. And he has claimed that murder is a sin. So do we hold to our own standard? Or do we hold to his? The abortion. The LGBTQIA++. The alphabet soup. We say, listen, don't worry about the science anymore. The science don't matter. Truth is merely what you make it to be. And if you're happy, it's okay. Isn't that what the world tries to do? Yeah, we know that suicide rates among this group are through the roof. Why? Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But if it makes you happy, the world says, who's it harming? What does it matter to you who I love? And that what the world says but it does affect me. It does matter to me because you're eroding truth. 
And that affects me and my family and my children. It does matter. Truth matters because God said that it matters. And either we believe him or we don't. Then thirdly is the erosion of the home. The home is under attack this morning. Satan from every angle is trying to attack the home. He's trying to cause dissension. He'll do everything he can. If he can erode the home, he's came a long ways towards reshaping our culture and our society. The bad thing is this morning, in many ways, he's been successful. He has. Now, I'm glad in the end that we know that we're all on the winning side and Christ will have ultimate victory. But in our culture, in our society, there's been a seismic shift in the home. Well, not only is the first fault line that of egocentrism, but the second is with the economic failure. Economic failure. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 10, the Bible says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. We have pursued earthly things of earthly value and have forgotten those things which are eternal. We have ignored the needy and downtrodden while basking in our own bounty. As America and as a nation, and I say America because that includes all of us here, no matter who you are, we're part of this. We have focused upon our own selves, our own needs, forget how these things affect the church and our brothers and sisters. We worried about ourselves and all we care about is ourselves, but also economic shortcomings. There's class warfare that is happening The middle class is being eliminated. The upper class is hated while gaining power. The poor are actively giving their power away to the very people they claim are suppressing them. There is class warfare that is happening because there's economic trouble. Satan is trying to divide. The problem is it's not just in the nation or the world, but often it affects within the church. We, if we're not careful, we will allow the world to creep into the church. We'll say, Pastor, that's out in the world, but then we come in to the body of Christ and we begin to divide ourselves into social cliques and groups. It shouldn't be. We should not allow the tactics of Satan to creep into our church, into our home, into our lives. In God's family, there's not different class classes, economic classes. We're all children of the king. The king of kings and the lord of lords. And so we must be careful. Second of all, there's a labor shortage. People don't want to work. They become lazy. A few do the work of many. We devalue hard work. So there's a labor shorter. And then thirdly, there's a slavery to debt. This past week, I don't know if you paid attention to the news, but our national debt surpassed $34 trillion. You don't have to be a genius to figure out we're in trouble financially. We're in trouble. It's unsustainable. You say, well, that's our nation, yes, but how many of God's people are also slaves to debt? We want to help, we want to give, but we can't. We want to do more, but we can't. A slavery to debt. And if we're not careful, Satan will trap us into a place that we shouldn't be. Well, thirdly this morning, thirdly, this last fault is compromising. Compromising. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. No one can serve two masters. So we've compromised. First, by compromising truth. We talked about that momentary, a moment ago, but this week the president of uh, Harvard had to step down because of anti-Semitism and, and uh, plagiarism. Yet just a week or so ago, the Board of Regents voted unanimously to keep her as the president. How can that be? Many of you who have been to college, you know that when you turn in your papers, they check for plagiarism, and if you were caught plagiarizing, you were kicked out of school, and yet we have the president of one of the leading universities in the world plagiarizing and saying it's so, everybody saying it's okay. We've compromised truth. We said, listen, it's okay as long as it meets our agenda. The ends justifies the means. Whatever happens, truth is compromised as long as it gets us where we're going. This morning, we as a church, as God's people, as husbands and wives, as mothers and fathers, we cannot compromise the truth. If God said it so, then it must be so. We cannot compromise. Here's where we get in trouble. Oftentimes, here is the the, the process that happens. The world is right here. And the church says, we will not be where the world's at. We're going to stand on the truth. But then as the world goes a little further, we stay arm distance. But the further they get from the truth, so do we. And in many ways, the church today is where the world was not too long ago. We have compromised the truth. We've worried so much about what we're against that we have forgotten what we are for and where we stand. We're not just standing against the world and culture. We are standing upon the Word of God. And this must be our foundation, the truth of God's Word. Young people... In school, in college, and and wherever you may go, I want you to know that you're going to find that the world is telling you that truth is subjective. But I want you to know it is not subjective. It is concrete. And what the Bible says, it didn't just matter when Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. It still matters today. It's still relevant. Truth does not change, even if it's inconvenient for you doesn't matter. We must not compromise on truth. Second of all, we have compromised in our pulpits. Pastors have failed to preach against sin. We have coddled woke ideology. We've watered down the gospel and pulpits across America have compromised. We must not compromise. I heard a pastor this week, uh, I follow a, uh, uh, I guess it's an Instagram account that kind of uh, shows crazy things preachers say sometimes, and uh, this pastor was talking, he was so upset, he said, used to you could say whatever you wanted to in the pulpit and nobody knew about it but your church, he said, now three minutes after the sermon, the whole world heard what you, heard what you said. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing if it means you have to stick to the truth. But often, even pastors have compromised the truth for convenience. This morning, I want you to know that I'm accountable to you as a church, but I'm also accountable to God to preach the truth. I don't ever want to compromise. I never want to compromise what God would say. 
just because it made things more difficult or challenging for me. We must stand true. Thirdly, we compromise our time. We've allowed our time to be compromised, and I preached on this not long ago. I believe it was on a Sunday night, but we have spent as a nation, but also as a church and a people, an unnatural amount of time on things with no real value, and we have neglected the things that are important. We're raising a generation of men and women that are oftentimes uneducated on time management and being wise. They live their lives in an unproductive or unproductive manner. Talking about staying up all hours of the night, playing video games, sleeping all day long, when they are awake on social media and, and, and to the point that they have no life outside of the virtual world that they're living in, it's not healthy. I'm not saying video games are bad. I'm not saying social media is bad. But it is bad if we neglect truth for these things. You say, Pastor, is it wrong to be on social media? No. But it's wrong to be on social media if you've not spent time with God. It's wrong to give our attention to things at the expense of neglecting Christ. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I want you to know this morning that Satan is trying to destroy our lives. He's trying to destroy our homes. He's trying to destroy our nation. And I'll be honest with you. I pray that America repents and comes back to God. I pray that God would send revival to America. But I'm not America first. It's about the kingdom of God first. Can I get an amen there? It's about heaven first. God does not have to have America. Now, I appreciate being American. I'm thankful for our liberties that we can serve. And God, with freedom, we have the ability to send missionaries out. We have liberty to share the gospel however and whenever we want to. We can worship freely. I thank God for these liberties. But what are we doing with them? We've squandered them too often. We hear of the atrocities of other nations where they're persecuted for even reading their Bible, but we don't even read ours. We hear of how horrible it is that people could be thrown in prison or their lives taken for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we don't even share it. What good are our religious liberties if we don't exercise them? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yet often he does not even have to devour us because we willingly lay down and give up. We've compromised our time. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Yes, our nation has some faults and seismic faults that our society and culture is being reshaping. And the truth of the matter is, I can change what I do, I can change what I believe to hold to the truth, and I can affect me, but I cannot individually change the picture as a whole. You by yourself are probably not going to reshape our nation. So what do we do? Here's what we do. Although we cannot change what's happening in the world, in your own life, build your life upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer to the problem. He's it. Young people, old people are alike, all of us, from the youngest to the oldest, from the richest to the poorest. It does not matter where or who you are in life. Build your life upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Hold fast to His truth. Do not allow yourself to be deceived by the world and the lies of Satan to focus your life upon yourself, but rather stay focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't compromise truth. Don't compromise your time. Rather say, I'm going to build my life upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when the culture has earthquakes and shakes and the walls tumble and fall, our foundation will not move. It will not change. But we can be steadfast through the Lord Jesus Christ. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. It may be a good idea for you and I to examine our own lives, our own hearts, and say, Lord, have I allowed the thought process of American culture worldliness to creep into my own heart and allowed me to begin to examine and view my life from a worldly perspective instead of a godly biblical perspective. Is culture dictating truth in your life or is God's word? Things may get a little rocky this year, especially with politics. But I want you to know that in my own life, I don't have to fear. Because I know that my foundation is steadfast and sure. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, today, would you pray and say, Lord, would you guard my heart? See, Satan's so sneaky often we don't even see what he's doing. Say, Lord, I want you to guard my heart to make sure that your will is in my heart. Today, maybe you're here and you might say, Pastor, I'll be honest with you. I hear what you're saying, but the truth is I I know about Christ, but I don't know him. This morning, I want you to know that there is no hope for your eternal soul apart from Jesus Christ. There's no even hope in this life apart from him. And today, if you would come and say, Lord, I want to make you the Lord of my life. 
I want to build my life upon your foundation. This morning he stands ready. He's willing to forgive you of your sins. He's willing to wash it away. He's ready to make your life anew, to be a firm foundation for you. If you'll just come and lay your life down at his feet.